Welcome to part two of diabetes. So in this part two, we are going to talk about diabetic complications. But before we begin on diabetic complications, let me do a bit of summary of diabetes so that we can get a review of what we have done on basic principles of diabetes. One of the things we've talked about is that diabetes is a group of diseases that are caused due to high blood sugars. And the fact is that insulin controls the entry of glucose into the cell and glucose is useful for energy production. So without insulin, glucose will not be able to enter the cell for glucose production. So diabetes is then caused by deficiency or resistance to insulin or both of these conditions. And we talked about the two types of diabetes, that is type 1 and type 2. There are of course many other types of diabetes including gestational diabetes, but these are the main types. The classical symptoms of diabetes is polyuria, polydipsia and polyphagia. And therefore, diagnosis of diabetes involves history, physical examination and investigations. When you come to management of diabetes, it becomes multidisciplinary disciplinary from diet, exercise and then drugs. The drugs can take the form of oral hypoglycemic drugs and insulin. So let us now talk about complications of diabetes. So complications of diabetes are divided into two parts. One is acute complications and then chronic complications. Acute complications are three of them, that is diabetic ketoacidosis, hypoglycemia, and diabetic non-ketotic hyperosmolar coma. Uh, chronic complications are also further divided into two. We have microvascular complications and macrovascular. Microvascular is those that affect the small blood vessels or capillaries, that is retinopathy, nephropathy, neuropathy. Diabetic foot takes the form of both. And then we have the macrovascular that involve the big blood vessels, the medium to large blood vessels, which is cerebrovascular, cardiovascular, and peripheral vascular disease, which is more or less the diabetic foot that takes both forms of microvascular and macrovascular. So we are going to start with acute complications and these acute complications I will begin with diabetic ketoacidosis. So diabetic ketoacidosis may be the first presentation of diabetes mellitus. Even if we talked about the classical symptoms, it may be the first presentation. And this results from absolute deficiency of, of insulin. Mortality is usually about 5%. <clears throat> now, let's talk about the pathogenesis so you, that you understand where diabetic ketoacidosis come, comes from. First, remember that there's no insulin uh, in patients with type 1 diabetes. So it is completely lack of insulin. That means that glucose cannot enter the cells to produce the energy that they so require for all those other metabolic um, functions that the cells need to carry out. So then what happens is that counter-regulatory hormones increase, that is the gluca glucagons, catecholamines, cortisol and growth hormone. All these work in tandem to increase the level of glucose because the cell does not have glucose entering the cell. So there is a trigger to produce more glucose and the trigger means that there's more insulin uh, glucose being produced. Already there was enough glucose in extracellular. So when you produce more glucose, it means it even increases further. There's also hepatic glucose production. And then there is reduced utilization of glucose by the peripheral tissues. What this means then is that there's so much glucose in extracellular yet intracellular there is no glucose at all so one, what what happens after this is that the body now tries to remove 
some of this glucose from the system because it's already overladen with glucose. So there's going to be glycosuria, osmotic diuresis, and dehydration. So the insulin is got rid of through the urine, and with that, um, the patient gets uh, dehydrated because they are losing a lot of water together with the glucose. That leads to release of free fatty acids into circulation from fatty tissue, which is being oxidized also to form energy. So we form now more ketones from fatty acids in a bit to still contribute to the formation of something that the cells can use for energy. So this results in ketonemia and metabolic acidosis because the ketones are acidic in nature. So then how do you diagnose a diabetic ketoacidosis? There are three things that you need to look out for. Probably four things. One is hyperglycemia. Then ketonuria and ketonemia if you are able to measure the ketones in the plasma. And then acidosis. And of course these patients come when they are very dehydrated. So four things. Hyperglycemia, ketonuria and ketonemia. Then acidosis and dehydration. So what predisposes to diabetic ketoacidosis? There are several things that predispose to this condition. One is infection, trauma, some form of stress, whether emotional stress or physical stress, myocardial infarction, stroke, and if a patient is going for surgery, then they may end up getting into a, a diabetic ketoacidosis. So when you come, when you see these patients, there are certain things that you need to look out for to, to know that this is actually um, ketoacidosis. So some of the things, if you're able to take history, sometimes they may come in coma, but if you're able to take history and they are not already diagnosed as diabetics, they may tell you that they have polyuria and polydipsia for polyphagia, just the classical symptoms of diabetes. Then, of course, there will be nausea and vomiting, particularly in the type 1s, then anorexia and abdominal pain. Then we have tachycardia. There is that fruity odor of the breath because of the ketones. Then hypotonia, stupor, coma. They'll talk of a lot of weakness. Remember, the cells are not getting enough energy, so the whole system is sluggish. Then, of course, there will be dehydration, and I hope that you know the signs of dehydration. They will be very dehydrated because as the body is trying to remove glucose, they lose a lot of water. So then, how do you manage, how do you treat patients with DKA? So, because they have lost a lot of water, they've also lost a lot of electrolytes, they've lost glucose, they don't have any energy at all. So you need to look at these principles. Uh, hyperglycemia, dehydration, acidosis, and ketonuria. One is fluid replacement. Remember, they've lost a lot of glucose as they lose a lot of water as they lose glucose. So fluid replacement then you give insulin because they still don't have insulin you have to give insulin then you correct the electrolytes correct the acidosis and then of course finally just treat the precipitating factor so that if it is infection then you need to treat that so that they don't have, end up with the same same thing so management of uh, diabetic ketoacidosis involves ensuring airway patent airway breathing and circulation and then you you have you need to put a large iv access remember you have to give fluids and the fluids we give is the 0.9 percent normal saline uh, one liter per hour and then you have to keep monitoring this every hour so that as you replace you monitor so that you are uh, you establish uh, a blood pressure should be stabilized and have a urine output of at least 30 to 60 mils per hour then of course you need to start a regular insulin drip of 0.1 at a rate of 0.1 units per kg per hour so you monitor this patient every 30 minutes and uh, the insulin and and monitor their sugar levels
then give sodium bicarbonate if there is severe acidosis and of course once you've done that and this, the patient is stable take a good history do a good examination and then come up with a diagnosis and treat the cause of all this So let us go to hypoglycemia, which is a second complication, acute complications of the uh, complication of diabetes. So hypoglycemia is the most frequent acute complication of diabetes, whether for type 1 or type 2. So it can be defined as a glucose level below 3.9 millimoles per liter. Of course, it can be moderate or severe hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia is at that level when we have the autonomic and neurologic dysfunction begin. So some of the manifestations of hypoglycemia include autonomic dysfunction, which are hunger, tremor, palpitations, anxiety, pallor, and sweating. So a patient may just start saying that they're just not okay, they have some mild headache, light headache, they're sweating. So these are some of the um, manifestations of hypoglycemia or if it goes further then there will be impaired thinking, change of mood, irritability, some headache, conversions before they get into coma. So what are some of the predisposing factors to hypoglycemia? It could be that these patients missed a meal when they were supposed to be eating or they have either increased uh, physical activi activity where they are supposed to walk for about um, 300 or 1 kilometer, they've decided all of a sudden they want to do a little more without uh, changing, without increasing their input of food or the medications. Then alterations in alterations or errors in insulin dosage. They are supposed to, to take a certain amount in the morning and a certain amount in the evening. So if they change that either due to their own thinking or just an error, that could result to hypoglycemia. And then we have alcohol ingestion because alcohol also decreases uh, glucose levels. So how do you treat patients who come with hypoglycemia? First of all, if a patient comes with coma, you must know whether it is hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia. So the first thing to do is to very fast do a random blood sugar so that you don't add glucose onto someone who is already having maybe hyper or smaller hyperglycemia. So the first thing is a random blood sugar. So if you notice that it is hypoglycemia, in mild cases, give a rapidly absorbed carbohydrates it could be sugar it could be honey it could be juice it could be milk something that can, can be rapidly absorbed and they will come back to life they will start speaking and all that then in severe cases these are patients who may be maybe uh, comatose you could give 25 or 50 percent dextrose and then um, or if you have you can also give I am glucagon injection. But after you've managed the hypoglycemia, then you really need to take a good history and just know what really triggered this hypoglycemia in these patients. Once you know that, also take the time to educate these patients on signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. <coughs> And they need to know that once they start having the sweating, anxiety, a light headache, then it's, a it's the time to maybe take a, a small snack or a sweet or some glucose. The other thing is that they need to also monitor their own blood sugar so that they know when, when, things, when sugar levels are up, when sugar levels are down, and also note what uh, the effects that they feel when sugar levels are up or down. Put that in a book so that when even when they go to visit their doctor they already know that this is the way the control of sugar levels has been patients also need to know that they shouldn't skip meals or delay meals or snacks they should measure their medications carefully and take it on time so if it is insulin they are taking 10 units it should be exactly 10 units it should not be increased or decreased uh, because then that predisposes them to hypoglycemia. 
then of course they can adjust their medications or eat additional snacks if they increase physical activity the other thing is that they need to carry a diabetes identification so that in an emergency others will know that uh, these patients are diabetic and they should be treated as as such so even other forms of illnesses for example hemophilia these patients need to carry that identification uh, uh, maybe a bracelet that says i am diabetic or i am hemophiliac just in case that needs to be known and they're not able to talk about it it could be a necklace it could be a bracelet or it could be some card that says this is my condition so that is hypoglycemia so let's move on to the third acute complication of diabetes which is hyperosmolar hyperglycemic hyperosmolar non-ketotic syndrome so this is a, uh, a complication that predominantly occurs in type 2s in which sugar levels are very high and they cause severe dehydration and increase in osmolarity these patients will present with dehydration seizures neurological signs and symptoms and then muscle fasciculations and hypothermia they also have excess thirst then um, in contrast to the DKA or diabetic ketoacidosis the onset of hyperosmolar non-ketotic coma syndrome is often insidious it comes slowly because it occurs most frequently in older people who already have some form of insulin it can also be mistaken for a stroke and since it, uh, these patients already have some form of insulin ketosis usually does not occur so it is a medical emergency and as a mortality as a very high mortality rate especially if it is not well diagnosed in time so management of hyperosmolar hypoglycemic non ketotic coma includes the same treatment for DKA because the pathophysiology is basically the same but when you're giving IV fluids give a uh, half strength normosiline which is 0.45% instead of 0.9% normosiline then of course give regular insulin by bolus followed by an infusion after that as you monitor the fluids to aid in reducing hyperglycemia when glucose level falls to approximately 13 uh, millimoles per liter then IV fluids can be changed to about 5 or 10 percent glucose to prevent hypoglycemia because these patients are likely to get hypoglycemic and very fast electrolytes must be monitored and replaced as needed remember potassium is being lost uh, sodium is being lost then vital signs of course is a must take vital signs input and output um, look at dehydration by looking at the tissue tagger la laboratory values and then of course cardiac monitoring to just know that you are not over giving the fluids because you may have also have cardiac complications if you give too much of the fluids and then look at electrolyte replacement as well as your renal functions so that sums up the three complications acute complications of diabetes in the next episode we will look at chronic complications of diabetes.